How we doing, everybody? Good. Hey, if I haven't met you yet, my name is Jake Blair. I'm one of the pastors at our downtown church, and it's an honor to be with you all this morning as we close down. This is our last week in our Jesus and series, so let's pour one out. Last time we get to see that cool bumper, um, but it's an honor to be with you. And this morning, I am teaching on Jesus and the little children, and it just so happens that we have a lot of kids here in the room. And we did not plan that out, just so you know. So like, look at God. God, won't he do it, y'all? Um, but before we get into the text, uh, I thought I want to share with y'all a story of when I first became a dad some nine years ago. We have a photo up there. And now, uh, yeah, our kids now, we have this year nine, seven, five, and we're about to welcome number four in about a month from now. So we're very excited about that. Uh, but one thing, so that's my daughter, Caroline, on the right, for those of you that need some direction. <laughs> Um, but one thing that parenting did not, uh, everything we've been told about parenting, what we were not prepared for, and for most of y'all who are parents, y'all are going to be like, well, yeah, obviously. We did not know how much babies cry. And of course, all of y'all are laughing, but for me, it's like, I knew that, but I didn't know the depths of it until parenting happened, where I remember we were in the hospital and then we were discharged after a couple nights in the hospital and we were just wide eyed, innocent thinking, are you sure we could stay here longer and you guys feed us and you can just take the baby away whenever? Are you sure? Okay. All right, here we go. And then we were at our house for the first night with our daughter and every sound she made, we were just in a panic, just anxious, rushing to her crib, making sure is everything OK. She would make the slightest cry in the middle of the night, whatever time of night it was, we would run to her crib to make sure is everything OK. And then over time, we just got to learn this is just what babies do. Babies just cry. They don't know any better. And we had this phrase that we developed maybe nine years ago to just say, hey, babies don't know, you know, because that's all they seem to do. And we began to learn, you know, cry cues for if they're hungry or if they're sleepy, if they need a change of diaper, they just cry because they have all these problems that they can't solve on their own. And so what do they do? They just cry and they cry because they need our help to help them. And so babies don't know. So they need to be fed. They don't know how to feed themselves. Babies don't know. So they cry. And that became so important for us as parents. And the reason I share that is as we move into this text, I want you to just have that image in your mind because we're going to get to it here in a moment. If you have a Bible, we're going to be in Luke chapter 18, verses 15 through 17. And to catch us up to speed, to give us some context here, this is in the middle of Jesus's ministry and he's going from town to town and he's talking about this big idea of the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. If you had to like break down Jesus's thesis statement as to what he is all about, it's this idea of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. It's this idea of heaven and earth merging together where God is dwelling with his people, where we can be with God and commune with God forever. And so Jesus goes from town to town, teaching about the kingdom of God to all these different people. And then as he arrives to this new town, he's starting to gain quite the following and some people gather around him. And then we jump to verse 15. Watch what happens. It says, now they were bringing even infants to him that he, meaning Jesus, might touch them. And what's interesting here, that word infants in the Greek is the word brephos. Normally, uh, whenever you hear or see the word children in the New Testament, it's this Greek word technon. But here he uses the word brephos, which in other Greek literature means like infants. Uh, some Greek literature will even use the word brephos to still refer to like babies in the womb. So these are like teeny, teeny, tiny babies that parents are bringing to Jesus in hopes that Jesus might heal these kids. Then check this out, verse 15. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked them. So check it out. We have these parents rushing up to Jesus with their sick children. And then the disciples start freaking out. 
And we're not really told why, but it is sort of weird to see this happening. And I would imagine the reason why the disciples start freaking out is because there are so many people surrounding Jesus. Jesus is trying to make sure people know about the kingdom of God and to live in it and to learn what it's about. And so the disciples are sort of acting as these bouncers as to who gets to Jesus, right? And I would imagine they're thinking, well, hey, these babies, they can't receive this teaching. They can't do the stuff Jesus is talking about. And Jesus has a lot of people he's trying to meet with. So please back up everybody. And then watch what happens. Verse 16, but Jesus called them to him saying, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them for to such belongs the kingdom of God. So Jesus sees what the disciples are doing. And it's like, Jesus says, hey, time out, guys. Disciples, come on, get over here, get over here. Hey, don't stop these parents from bringing their kids because actually the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, which is what I'm all about. If you really wanna know what I'm all about, just look to these children. So he affirms their dignity and their value and their worth. And he's saying, if you want to know what the kingdom of heaven, what I'm trying to get at, just look at these kids in these parents' arms. And what's wild to think about is that the assumption back then was that the kingdom of heaven was going to come through military might or force, that God would raise up a Messiah, a king from the line of David. He would sit on the throne in Jerusalem. He would raise up an army from Israel and they would wipe out all of the other empires and oppressors that tried to rule against them. That was the vision for how the kingdom of heaven was going to happen. But here Jesus is saying, if you really want to know what the kingdom of heaven is about, look at these little children. So the disciples, I'm sure are probably, their minds are being stretched thinking, what are we talking about? I thought the assumption was like through an army or a military power, you're saying it's little kids. I don't know what they're thinking, but my brain goes to an image of like little kids dressed up as soldiers, which is like kind of cute. If you think about it, it does get a little dark if you think about it for too long, but that's where my mind goes. I don't know about you. But Jesus is saying the way the kingdom of God will happen, it's not through might or power, but a spiritual renewal of the heart. And if you really want to understand that, look to the children. Then verse 17, Jesus doubles down on this. He says, truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. So check that out. Jesus says in some way, shape or form, children are meant to be an example to all of us here in the room. So kids in the room, did you hear that? So it's like 98, 99% of the time, it's the grownups who have something to teach you. And with this moment, Jesus is saying, y'all have something to teach us. So kids look to your parents and say, you're welcome, you know? But this poses the question, this poses the question, in what ways does Jesus want us to be like children? What do the youngest of us in the room have to teach us about following Jesus? And let me go ahead and pull the curtain back. Is that in this passage in Luke 18, Jesus does not explain what he means, which I don't know for you, but for me as a Bible reader, I find that a little frustrating where Jesus says, hey, if you want to know what the kingdom of God is like, look at these children. All right, on to the next thing. And it's like, wait, what are we talking about? Go, go back to that thing that you said, Jesus, but he doesn't. So here's what we have to do. This is a little bit of Bible study 101. The early church and the early uh, church writers, writers of the New Testament had this understanding, these two principles when it came to reading the Bible. Number one was this idea that scripture is the sole authority. Like when we read scripture, it is God speaking to us. So we need to listen and he has the authority over and against any other competing worldviews or ideas out there. So that's number one is that scripture is the authority. And then lane two, because of that, you let scripture interpret scripture. So when we get to unclear parts of the Bible or confusing parts, what we need to do is we need to let the rest of scripture speak into the parts that are not clear for us. So when we encounter a text like this and Jesus says, let the little children come to me and he does not explain what he means, we need to let the rest of scripture speak into that to help fill in the knowledge gaps, so to speak. 
So back to my question, in what ways does Jesus want us to be like children? Looking at the rest of the New Testament and the rest of Jesus's teaching, I came up with three things. I'm sure we could think of more, but for the sake of time, I got three for us, all right? First one is dependence. Dependence. In other words, children know full well everything they need and want and that they can't do it on their own. They need someone else to do it. And mom and dad, if you were to just ask your kid, hey, what do you need? What do you want right now? I guarantee you they could probably list off a dozen things at the drop of a hat, just like that. It's like, well, I want to go to this restaurant. I want to eat this. I want to watch this show. I want to play this game. They can just rattle it off because they are full. They are fully aware of what they have and don't have and that you could be the solution to that. There's this dependence that kids have on parents. I think back to my illustration at the start, my daughter crying out to me. Why did she cry out to me? Because she knows she can't do anything on her own. She needs assistance. She needs a power outside of herself if she wants to be fed or bathed or put to bed. And her cries are her native tongue. It's her only vocabulary to communicate to us. And as a baby, she knows her place. And when she cries, it's like she's saying, hey, I can't do this. I know you can. Please help me. And there's a humility that that child, a little child has to know they are fully aware of what they can and cannot do. Now doing the scripture interprets scripture. Where do we see this? We see this in Matthew chapter 18. Jesus says in a very similar teaching of Luke, he says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So there you go. Jesus says to be like a child is to humble yourself. And when I say humble yourself, I mean realizing your need on God the Father. You can't do anything on your own. So parents, if you're like, well, shoot, I know my kids, they are not humble. It's like, okay, yes. And we're not talking about that. We're talking about this understanding that you need everything from God the Father. You can't do it on your own. And as a result, we let the cry of prayer become our native tongue to say, when we pray, God, I need you. I can't do this on my own. Will you help me, please? Not just in the moments of hardship and suffering, although that's often when we feel the most helpless, but to learn in every category of our life, moment by moment, second by second, just how much we need God the Father to sustain us and to draw him to himself. To think about the body that God has given you, the breath that you are drawing into your lungs, even at this very moment, your heart beating right now in your body, that is all made possible because God chose to, and he is sustaining you even right this very second. And so to be a child of God is to realize each and every moment more and more just how much you need him to sustain you in life. God, I need you. I can't do it on my own. Will you help me? And the more you lean into this dependence, the more you realize who you are and who you're not. And the more you press into humbling yourself, the more you see who God is as a heavenly father who loves you. And this flies in the face of pull yourself up by your bootstraps, Christianity that says God helps those who help themselves, right? And if what we mean by that is there is um, deep abiding in your soul and a peace in your soul when you obey God, if that's what we mean, it's like, that's great. We have lots of scripture to back that up. I'm great with that. But oftentimes what that means when we say, pull yourself up by your bootstraps is, hey, if you really want to experience grace and mercy from God, you got to get your act together and you need to do X, Y, Z, and you need to learn to be independent. And only then will God help you. If that's what we mean, that is not the gospel. That is anti-Christianity. That is anti in the face of what Jesus is going after here. Also, what even are bootstraps? I don't know. So I already just don't like it, right? We're on to point two. Second thing that Jesus is teaching us, what it means to be like a child is to have faith. Faith. That when a kid is dependent on mom and dad for everything, there's a sense of trust that develops from the kid to the parent. And the kid is confident that when they cry, mom and dad are going to answer. That kid has faith. 
Similarly, when you're a child in the family of God, when you know God as a heavenly father, there's a confidence, there's a trust that comes from that. There's a faith that results from knowing who you are in the family of God. I don't know what it's like at your home, but I think about for my kids, they know full well who they are in our family and they can come to us with really anything that's on their mind at whatever hour of the day it is. So I see this a lot, especially on the weekends when my wife and I try to sleep in. And by sleep in, I mean like 7 a.m. If we can get to 7 a.m., it's like, oh my gosh, we are fully charged. We can just tackle the day. That tends to not happen because what will usually happen is around 6.30 or so, I will hear the pitter-patter of one of our kids like running down the stairs and coming to our room and then it stops. At that point, I am woken up even over the sound machine. I can hear them uh, like outside of our room and then I'll open my eyes and I'll see like the shadow of footsteps just right underneath the door. And then I will pretend to fall back asleep. Hopefully that, you know, my kids will open the door and they'll say, oh, mom and dad are sleeping. That hasn't worked yet, but... (laughs) They will slowly creak open the door and they'll like slowly walk up to one of us and then they'll just start gently waking us. Mom, dad, mom, dad, hey, I'm hungry. Hey, can I, can I go play some toys? Mom, dad, mom. And it's like, what? Okay, yes. I say that to say they are fully confident because of who they are in the family. They can come talk to us whenever they want. I remember this was like a couple months ago. My youngest daughter, Kate, who is five, did this whole routine at 2 a.m. in the morning. And it was funny because (laughs) I was asleep the whole time. She came running down, opened the door, got right next to my wife, about two inches away from her face and said, mom, Mom, and then I woke up to the sound of my wife shrieking and I then I shot up and I was like, get back to your room, it's 2 a.m. And she like ran away. But still, <laughs> all that to say, my kids are fully confident in who they are and uh, who they are in the family. And because of that, they know they can come to us with anything that is on their mind at any hour of the given day. Now, I think about what it means to be a child of God. To be a child of God is to rest confidently and to trust in who God is, to know who we are in the family, that he loves us, he protects us, he will never let us go. And because of that, we can approach him with whatever is on our minds, whatever is on our hearts, whatever is bothering us, whatever is delighting us right now. And we can just go to him at any moment of the day. And he delights in us to hear us talk to him. Now, again, using that scripture, interpret scripture method. Look with me, Matthew chapter seven. Jesus says this elsewhere. He says, if you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus is using hyperbole to get across how good the father is, just how gracious and abundant our heavenly father is. And because of that, we can go to him. We can ask him for what is ever is on our minds. We can talk to him and ask him for things because we know we are his kids and he is our heavenly dad. And if you don't have that sort of confidence before God, the father, I've got another verse for us. John chapter 10. Again, Jesus says, I give them, I give them eternal life and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. So get that. No one, nobody, nothing in all of creation can grab you out of the Father's hand. He is faithful. He will keep his word. When he says, you are my child, that is the truest thing about you. When he says, I love you and I will never forsake you, that means that there is nothing you have done or could ever do to make The father second guess his love for you. The father is not looking for your emotions to be a certain way. He's not looking for your mental health to be a certain way. He's not looking for a certain track record to be a certain way. He accepts you and loves you and says, you are my child. You are a son. You are a daughter of the king. Now rest in that confidence. Rest in that trust and security of who you are in the family. And when you do, you realize you're his child, you're his kid, and nothing will ever change that. Hear me, for whoever needs to hear this, your sin does not scare God. 
Your sin does not make him wince back in disgust or make him second guess his ability to save you. This verse is clear. No one is able to snatch them out of the father's hands. If your faith is in Jesus, he will never let you go because you are his little child. One last one for us is imitation. Imitation. You see, when a child learns that they are dependent on mom and dad, when they have faith, when they have trust in mom and dad, when they know my parents love me and they provide for me, that child eventually grows to imitate them. They're going to want to talk and walk and do all sorts of things because they know mom and dad love me and I want to be like my parents. Imitation is the natural result of being in a loving, dependent relationship like a child and a parent. I think back to when I was a kid, uh, my dad uh, worked on cars for a living like his whole life. And I remember it was on a Saturday afternoon. I was maybe five or six. And what my dad would tend to do on the weekends is he would be working on cars and he would have the car hood opened up and he was with a buddy of his and they were working on these cars and they were getting all this car grease and stuff on them. And I remember being inside looking at my dad, who I just love and respect so much still, and thinking, I want to do that. And I remember rushing out to him on a Saturday afternoon and it's hot as all get out. And I remember asking him, hey, can I, can I help? And keep in mind, I know nothing about car auto mechanics, and I still don't other than, you know, gas goes in this spot. That's about the extent of my car knowledge. But I remember thinking, hey, can I, can I help? And my dad and his buddy just like looked at me and they're covered in car grease. And they're like, uh, yeah, buddy, just go knock yourself out. And I remember getting just so amped up and excited that I leaned over the car hood and I just start putting my hands all over the car pieces, seeing how far my arms could go down inside the hood. And I'm just, my body's like crawling all over these car pieces. And then after a few minutes, I get up and like my whole body and all my hands are just covered in car grease. And I, th- I remember thinking to myself, I did it. <laughs> I fixed the car. And to me, it was like, I, and I look like my dad. And I remember telling my dad, I was like, all right, thank you. I'm going to go back inside now. And my dad and his buddy are just <laughs> so confused, like what on earth just happened? But I remember I just wanted to do what my, I saw my dad do. And I wanted to look like my dad and I had the dirt to prove it. And in the same way, little kids, when they know deep down in their bones how loved they are by their parents, there's this deep sense of trust and confidence that they want to be like their parents. Now, look again with me in the New Testament. We see this teaching, this idea of imitation, getting across what it means to be a child of God. Ephesians 5.1, Paul says, be imitators of God as beloved children. (laughs) be imitators of God. So there's this assumption Paul has here. If we uh, learn to trust and walk in confidence and to know God the Father in scripture and in prayer and community, the natural result is that we will want to exhibit the characteristics and patterns of God the Father and that through his spirit, that is actually possible. This is what Jesus is getting at as well in Matthew 5, 48, when he says, you therefore must be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. To be clear, Jesus is not talking about in that verse, moral perfection. Instead, that word perfect is the Greek word teleos, meaning wholeness. It's the Greek equivalent of these two Hebrew words, shalom and tamim. It's this idea of completeness, of single-minded devotion, this pure in heart, uh, singular vision to go after God and his kingdom, to want nothing more than that in your life. And the New Testament is filled with this vision that the more I chase after God, the more I meditate and study on his word, the more I'm in community, the more I practice the things he calls me to do, the more I take on his characteristics through the Holy Spirit. To put it another way, the more you look to him, the more you will look like him. And that's catchy. So you know that it's true. The more I meditate on the father's love, the more the spirit works in me to become a person of love. And the more I think about God's forgiveness for me, how even in my worst moments and in the depths of my sin, when I realize that God has forgiven me, the more I think about that, the more that moves me to become a person of forgiveness. Likewise, the more I dwell on God's patience with me, even when I, if I can be honest, even when I can be a little annoying, right? 
the more I realize how patient God is with me, the more that frees me up to be a person of patience, even around people who might get on my nerves from time to time. The more I look to him, the more I will look like him. And those are three ways we can see from scripture how we are called to be like little children. And I'm sure we could think of more, but for the sake of time, I think these three are a really helpful snapshot as to what it means to be a little child in the kingdom of God. So the question we have to wrestle with now is in what ways is it hard for me to live like a child of God? In what ways am I resisting being a child? In what ways is the spirit prompting me to be more and more like his little kid? Because I would argue as counterintuitive as it sounds, the way to grow and mature in the kingdom of God is to be more and more like a little child pressing further and further into these three ideas. And if I can admit, it's so tough because even after following Jesus for a couple of decades, there are still parts of me that want to rebel, that want to insist on my own way, that want to be self-sufficient. And that's standard for every other manner of life. Like there will certainly come a time, right? When uh, my kids and your kids, they are going to learn to be independent in nearly, if not every category of life. That day will come when they move out of the house and go to college and get jobs and start families. I know that day is coming. In fact, I've got a running joke with my kids that I've been doing for years now. Every time it's one of their birthdays or whenever I'm gone from work for a few days and they just seem taller and more mature, I usually like will grab their face and say, now kids, you need to stop growing up. Can you make that promise to me? And then they roll their eyes and they say, dad, I am growing up. I am going to grow up. And then I just start to fake cry and say, no, stop it. Stop it. And, you know, they roll their eyes and they laugh and I laugh. And again, it's just been this whole bit that's been going on for the last few years. Um, But I say that to say, while I know that they are going to grow up, even still, they are always going to be my little kids. And I'm always going to be their dad. And even though every area, every other area of life says to grow and mature is to be self-sufficient and independent, the way of Jesus says the way to maturity is to realize more and more your insufficiency. In God's kingdom, if you want life, you need to die to self. If you want to experience riches in the kingdom of God, give away your riches in this life. If you want to be a mature saint in his kingdom, learn to be his little kids and never move away from that. And it's strange because the older you get, the more you realize how helpless you really are in this life. As adults, we can do all we can to plan and prepare and schedule. And yet when the unexpected happens or when the phone call comes that you didn't expect or when you enter into a new season of life, it opens your eyes to just how powerless you are and how much you need Jesus to sustain you and how much you need to be like his little child. I have friends of mine right now who they have a number of kids and right now their oldest ones are getting to be juniors and seniors in high school and their oldest is about to move away to college and they are feeling this right now. Even though they would say, we've been parenting them their entire lives to teach them what the Bible is about, to help them learn to love Jesus. And we don't have any regrets and we've done the work. And now this one's 18 and they're about to go to college. And what's going to happen? We really don't know. And God, we need you because uh, it's just a big question mark how they're going to turn out. God, help us. We need you so much. And they are learning more and more right now even after walking with Jesus for decades and after parenting their kids for years and years, they are learning more and more what it means to be like a little child in the kingdom of heaven. And I imagine imagine Jesus welcoming them with a smile on his face to say, welcome, the kingdom of heaven belongs to kids just like you. So I don't know how this sermon hits you or what you need to process with God right now. So to end our time, I think it's fitting if we go to him in prayer. So let's go ahead and let's do that.